Um, we really do function as consultants and uh, we work, or we have teams of trade specialists that engage with your company and basically help you, well, A, operationalize for exporting. So just make sure everything's you know, optimized, you're aware of all the different programs that are available to you, the financing mechanisms, all the stuff that's out there to help your company succeed internationally. And then on the overseas side, we have uh, commercial officers that work in all of the, well, most of the embassies, I mean, 85 of the embassies worldwide and consulates. So any place you'd want to do business, we have a person over there whose sole job is to help American businesses penetrate that country. So I know that's outside of the scope of this presentation, but um, this is just one small service that we offer to our clients among many, many other services. So following the presentation, if you haven't worked with us in the past, definitely connect with us. Almost all of our, um, our services are free. Uh, the overseas services have small fees associated with them, but as a former private sector guy, I mean, they're never ever anything even remotely close to what you'd see in the private sector. You know, it's hundreds of dollars type stuff to get uh, various services done for you in these countries. So, so keep all that in mind. Um, this presentation came from when I joined um, the U.S. Commercial Service a number of years ago. Uh, one of the things, of course, we were looking at is website. Website, internet, super important, doing business domestically as well as internationally. And we actually initially started looking around to see if there was a private sector company that we could partner with that would work with our clients to help them globalize their websites. The thing about it is it'd be really easy for me to get on here and just say, all you need is a budget of a million dollars and you can have an amazing website. For, you know, our clients are typically small, mid-sized companies. They don't have enormous amounts of money to throw at, um, well, many things, including their website. So we couldn't find a private sector company that was interested in helping with the, let's call it the preliminary initial things that companies can do to sort of start taking steps towards becoming a fully globalized presence on the internet. And so we developed this program. So what I'm gonna be talking to you today about in this presentation are things that are basically cost-free that you can do. You don't need to be a technical expert to do them, but they're gonna have a huge, huge, huge impact on your ability to reach uh, potential customers in other countries. Um, we, when we built this, we, we did it in collaboration with people in our forum posts. So they, uh, you know, we asked them, what do people in your country, what are, what are their gripes with American websites, you know? And they went around and talked to businesses and came back with a bunch of information and we've built all that into this presentation. And then one more comment before I get going on the slides. Um, we also do website globalization reviews for specific companies. So if following this presentation, and, and you all can get a copy of this presentation, um, you may decide to go modify your website a little bit with what we talk about. If you then want us to do a, a deeper dive into your specific website, we'll do that and we'll give you a report and a bunch of recommendations, um, re things related to search engine optimization and whatnot, much more in depth than what you're gonna see today. Um, so with that, let me get rolling. Bear with me, the slides aren't changing. There we go. Okay. All right, so um, website globalization is kind of a, a big umbrella term uh, that, that basically like says on the slide, it, it relates to comprehensive strategy that's gonna fuse all these globalization best practices with your specific company. Um, typically companies go through a phased approach. So. Most of what we're going to be talking about today is that first bullet point there, the simple enhancements. And again, uh, some of this stuff, as I'm going through it, it may seem almost uh, silly and trivial, but this is all based on actual feedback we've gotten from companies overseas. So even though it's very, very simple, we've, we've realized that it makes an enormous difference for you um, when, when foreign visitors come to your website. So that's mainly what we're gonna be talking about today. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about um, internationalization, which is essentially making sure your website is globally neutral. So it doesn't really, it doesn't offend anybody uh, worldwide. Um, 
and you know it is it's technically optimized and whatnot so that anybody in the world lands on your site it's going to function properly it's going to look good to them etc regionalization would is typically the next step companies will take and that refers to modifying your website for a particular region like south america not a particular country which is what localization is um, like mexico for example right so we'll, we'll touch on those uh, three of course we'll talk about translating your website which for obvious reasons is a really big deal when you're talking about website globalization. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can proactively promote your website in other countries and then we'll talk a bit about international e-commerce. So simple enhancements. Now this when I mentioned some of these changes are going to sound almost silly. Uh, this is one of them but this makes a giant difference. The feedback we got from companies from every region in the world was that American companies have a really bad reputation around exporting. Um, and, and, you know, you guys may have seen the statistics. Among industrialized countries, the United States, U.S. companies export far, far less than companies in any other industrialized country around the world. So American companies have a bad reputation of just knowing how to do it. And what a lot of the companies overseas said to us was, look, you know, even if a company in the U.S. has what we're looking for, the last thing we want to try to do is teach them how to export to us. So the point being that it's it's really important that right on your website, right on your homepage, you make it very obvious that you're open for international business. So on this uh, slide here, there's an example of that. So White Labs has a very obvious, almost impossible to miss, uh, link that says international inquiries. Well, anybody that lands on this website will immediately know that they are, in fact, interested in international business. And although, you know, having a link like that on some website doesn't necessarily mean the company's competent <laughs> at exporting, it's at least an indication that the company's interested. And more than likely, why would they have that on there if they didn't even know how to export something? So, bottom line is, make sure that you have something that's really obvious on your homepage that uh, that foreign visitors are going to notice so that they know you're open for international business because that really was one of the most consistent pieces of feedback we got u.s companies that don't make that obvious uh, they'll often just move on and find a company that does appear to be interested in exporting so when you do that you're going to want that link to you know connect to probably some sort of a contact us uh, page. And there's a couple of best practices around this that you want to put into practice. One is, you know, a lot of companies out there will use some sort of catch-all info at company.com. It's much better to break out international in some way. So on this slide, it shows international sales and then have somebody's name, you know, like Tony at company.com. It just makes it more personal, and that's much more important internationally in many countries. Uh, in the U.S., you know, you could probably just get away with info at company.com. But for international reasons, uh, it's, it's good to have it broken out. It serves a couple of purposes. One, again, obviously, you're interest, interested in international sales. Why would you even have that there if you weren't? Uh, and it appears that there's somebody who's actually responsible for international sales at your company. Um, so it's a really good idea to do that. And of course, you know, that's a you take a webmaster all of two minutes to put that onto your site. Uh, better yet, the best thing to do is actually create a separate contact us page for international inquiries. And I'm going to show you an example of one of those in just a second. But that really shows, you know, A, that you're int interested in international business. It also gives you the ability to collect a little bit more information because domestic customers, you probably don't need a whole lot of info from them to feel comfortable reaching back out and getting in touch with them. An international customer, you might want a little more information. Uh, so anyway, I'll show you an example of that. Uh, and, and that's really the best practice. Uh, you want to show your address anywhere on your website, including on your contact us page, the same way you would as uh, you'd put it on an envelope, except you don't want to abbreviate anything because people overseas aren't going to know what GA means necessarily. And you also want to make sure you include USA in your address. So contrary to a lot of what we all see in the news nowadays, um, normal people, business people in other countries are very, very interested in US products. Uh, we rightfully 
have a reputation for having the highest quality stuff in the world. Uh, other people in other countries, they want our stuff. So they will be actively searching for companies that are in the United States because that's who they want to do business with. And if you don't have USA in your address and they come to your website, they won't inherently know that, uh, that you're an American company. Um, you know, most websites on the internet are in English. So include that. It's such a simple thing to add. And it, again, came from a lot of feedback that we've gotten from companies overseas that it makes a big difference. And here's another sort of interesting little story specific to us here in Georgia. We actually had a situation where uh, we started hearing that uh, foreign buyers were finding Georgia companies and they were just moving on uh, because and the feedback that our people overseas were getting was, well, but I'm not interested in products from Georgia. I'm interested in products from the USA because Georgia is a, co a country <laughs> and probably not a country that you'd be buying a lot of things from. So for us in Georgia, that's uh, doubly important because good chance people will land on your website and think that you're in the country of Georgia. You wanna provide direct dial phone numbers, toll free often doesn't work overseas. And just another, since it's so easy to do, uh, thing to, to, to include on your site is add that plus one Almost everybody in the world knows plus one is for the US, but uh, we had our folks in Scandinavia specifically sort of poked back at us and they said, well, what's Sweden's country code? And of course I had no idea. And they said, so, you know, it's just, it's culturally insensitive to just assume that everybody knows the American country code, um, even though they do, because <laughs> it's plus one, but, uh, but include it. It just makes your company look that much more culturally sensitive. And uh, it's just one more little marketing thing that may encourage a company to reach out to you. So let me show you an example of a really good contact, international contact us form. And then I'll, I wanna ask you guys if you have any questions up to this point, but um, this, this company, Cineron, they've won a lot of uh, awards for their website globalization practices. So here, here's their international inquiries form. I think they've changed a little bit since this was pulled together, but fundamentally it's the same. So you see right there at the top in the red circle, they have a uh, they have a web an email link, and then they also have a direct dial phone number. Now they do have info at Cineron.com, which I mentioned isn't ideal, uh, but at least they do have the ability to, uh, to to send them an email. But then they also have a form, which is probably more important. Um, one of the reasons the form is so important is that in many foreign countries, people are still going to internet cafes and whatnot to access the internet and do research or universities and, and so on. So they may not, well, they won't have an email client on the computers they're using. So if all you have is an email address and they click it, they don't have any way of really sending you an email. I mean, they could, they could log into their Gmail and, and go sort of roundabout. But the bottom line is you wanna make it as easy as, as you can for them to reach out. So the form enables, it enables anybody that lands on your website, regardless of what computer they're using um, or mobile device to go ahead and fill out your form and submit it to you. So it really is a best practice to have both, but especially the form. So you hear, see here on this form, um, common fields, you know, your company may decide that for whatever products you're selling, you wanna actually gather more information. The key thing is you wanna ask for as little as possible, right? But um, but but enough to feel comfortable reaching out to this uh, this person in, in another country. Uh, one thing to note is zip codes. A lot of countries don't use zip codes, and countries other than the U.S. that do use zip codes, um, it, they have letters often. So if for some reason you feel like you do need a zip code from uh, these these foreign visitors, make sure that it is capable of taking any type of character. Now here on Cineron's form, that's a required field. And if it's numbers only, of course, the person wouldn't be able to fill it out if they're in any of the other countries that also use letters. So it's just one of those little inconvenience. You know, people defeat it by putting one, 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 or whatever, but you just wanna make it as easy as possible for people to reach out to you. Um, the other interesting little thing that came up, uh, which is minor, but can make a difference, uh, is changing on your international inquiries form, change the text submit to send. In a lot of other countries, apparently, when they translate the word submit into their language, it has a legal connotation, sort of like there's some sort of a commitment associated with submit. 
and um, and and they may be a little hesitant to to click that button. Uh, so such an easy thing to change, just change it to send. Uh, and apparently, you know, in some countries that, that can really, it, it can make somebody hesitate to, to click the button and reach out to you just because they feel like there may be something more, more binding associated with this form than just simply initiating communication. So does anybody have any questions about anything I've mentioned so far? Okay. You guys can still hear me, right? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Okay, good. That happened to me before. I was went 10 minutes into a presentation and I had been cut off. <laughs> okay, um, I mentioned the postal codes. In general, you want to allow for longer lines. Essentially, if you are going to ask for information, uh, addresses or whatever, make sure that the, the, the lines are long enough so they can actually fill them in. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you all have seen sometimes in these other countries, uh, names and whatnot can be a lot bigger than names in the U.S. Like that example, Mar Maria Teresa Garcia Ramirez de Arroyo. You know, uh, if all you have the first name, last name field, that person may have a hard time kind of figuring out where to put that. So uh, best practice on an international forum is just to include a name field and let them put their name in in whatever way they, they decide they need to put it in or want to put it in. Um, you need to allow for any number of digits and phone numbers. That's important to note because a lot of the, uh, the tools that you use to build websites are going to have a phone number field, but it's going to have masking on it already that's typically, uh, if you just use the field they have, it's going to be for US phone numbers. So it's easy to change that, but you just need to make sure you do so that you don't end up with a phone number field that uh, only allows US phone numbers to be input. Uh, it's a good idea to request that, that they don't use abbreviations for the same reason that you don't wanna use abbreviations because you may not really know what the abbreviation means. And then you always wanna include a country and city field. Um, part of the reason there is there's unfortunately a growing denied parties list out there. And those are basically people in the world that you're just not legally allowed to do business with uh, for various reasons people and companies. Uh, it, it, there's, it's really easy to figure out if somebody that's reached out to you is one of these denied parties, but there's certain information, including the country and the city that they're in, that you'll need to collect in order to do that. And we can help you do that. You know, um, Our trade specialists can, can help you with that, but, but it is important to make sure you collect that info. You probably want to collect that info, country, definitely, uh, probably city anyways, but just, just make sure you do include that on your form. And then these are two examples of different addresses, right? The one on the left is in Japan, the one on the right is in the Netherlands. Uh, obviously the format is dramatically different. So you wanna make sure that if you decide you even need a full address, which you probably won't, but if you do for some reason, just make sure that it's some sort of field that'll accommodate the proper address as it goes on an envelope, like those two examples. Okay, so before I talk to you guys a little bit about translation, do you guys have any questions about any of that stuff I just mentioned? It's pretty straightforward. And like I said at the beginning, I know it, it seems, <laughs> it almost, some of them are so simple, it almost seems silly, but it will really make a difference. Uh, we've had clients, by the way, that have done nothing but put into a, a uh, affect all of the stuff in this presentation and they've seen pretty dramatic increase in their international uh, internet internet traffic so it works all right so let's talk about translation a little bit so this is usually pretty good news for our clients uh you do not need to translate your website often you know, companies coming into this website globalization service believe that they, they often come in thinking that's the number one thing they need to do is translate their website. And it, it really isn't. Uh, there is, fortunately, the English is still the, the, the global language of business. Uh, nobody's surprised to see an English website on the internet, uh, particularly a US English website. So translation is really viewed, it's, it's certainly an incredibly good thing to do assuming you have the resources and can do it right and all that, but it really isn't necessary. It doesn't hurt you to have an English only website. 
and a lot of the machine translators, which I'm going to talk about a little more in a second, you know, they're getting better and better. They're built into the browsers now. Um, it's pretty easy for a foreign visitor to translate your website proactively using one of those machine translators. And that's that's often a better choice anyways for a couple of the reasons I'm going to give you in a minute. But the bottom line is, unless you're ready to actually translate your website professionally, it's better just to leave it in English. Um, uh, you know, for one thing, so we have clients that have had, you know, they've got their kid, their kid is taking Spanish in high school or something, and they've, as a project, they let the, their child translate their their company's website. This is a really bad idea. It's going to, no matter how good that person is at Spanish, uh, there's, it's going to be fraught with, uh, with errors and, and weird, probably weird sayings and things. Um, I imagine we've all seen some strangely translated stuff in the past. Uh, it's really better just leave it in English unless you're going to actually hire somebody professionally to do it. And when it comes around the uh, comprehensively translating an entire website, this is another problem that companies often will run into. It, well, in German, for example, the word for speed is that giant word. I don't even know how to pronounce it. And the word for speed in Chinese is that symbol down there. So if you were to take your website today and just translate it into German, there's a good chance it's going to get all wonky because the text boxes are a certain size and all of a sudden all the words in German became humongous and they don't fit. So it starts shoving the graphics around a little bit um, and or you translate it into Chinese and all of a sudden there isn't as much text. The text box is big. And there's a lot of white space left. So the point being that it can change the actual structure of your website. So if you do decide that you're going to comprehensively translate your whole website into a foreign language, it's another reason you'd want professional assistance because there's probably going to be some design uh, changes that need to be made as well. So obviously this starts to get pretty expensive, right? Um, so re related to the machine translators, this is kind of a silly example, but we do have some clients that have actually, they'll, they'll use a machine translator to just translate their whole website and then they post their website in that translated language. Well, again, silly example, but this drives home the reason that's not a great idea. In Spanish, como means how, mucho means much, but como mucho doesn't mean how much. It means I eat a lot and quanto means how much. Now, most machine translators at this point would probably catch this particular error. But there's a lot of stuff like this that'll happen when you use a machine translator. It will literally translate each word in a sentence. And very often that's not, uh, the context gets completely knocked out of whack. So if somebody were to proactively use a machine translator, like in Google, to translate your website, and they get some wacky stuff like this, they're not going to, you know, they don't look at your company any, any differently. They think, oh, stupid Google, you know, it didn't translate this right. But of course, if you translate it and then post it as your website, well, then they think that your company's just, you know, made a giant error and, and it, it hurts you more than it helps you. It's like having spelling errors on your brochures at a trade show. You know, it doesn't make you look good. So you don't want to use machine translators to comprehensively translate your whole website. Uh, like I said, most of these translators are now built into the browsers and people know about that. So just let them use the machine translators if they need to translate your site. This is a other couple of uh, what I thought were funny examples, and these are real. It's hard to believe huge companies blow it like this. But Pepsi actually went to China, and they decided, come alive with Pepsi. That, that was a great slogan, so they wanted to keep that. But when it was translated, it actually translated into, Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the dead, which was not the message they were going for. And then Kentucky Fried Chicken, with finger licking good, it ended up translating into eat your fingers off. Um, so both humongous swings and misses, uh, even by these giant companies. It's, like I said, hard to believe. I mean, that they didn't run this past somebody and say, you know, does this look like a good idea to you? But they did it. So anyway, it's another reason, you know, translation's tricky, especially in difficult language languages like Asian languages. Um, definitely want to use professionals if you decide you're going to go there. Any questions about any of that stuff? George, I have a question. If a company yeah. is interested in having their website translated professionally, is that a service that U.S. Commercial Service, US Commercial Service offers or do you refer them to someone? 
we, re we would refer them to someone. And often what we'll do is refer them, we'll go through our post in whatever uh, target country they're going for, right? And uh, post, because it's often makes more sense to get some local web company to do the translation, although there's plenty of companies in the US. Bottom line is we'll refer them to somebody that can help them with that. Any other questions? Okay. This is another problem in a lot of ways with comprehensively translating your whole website and then putting it up on the internet. Um, when you do that, the perception is that you are ready to do business in the language. Uh, I think just like all of us, if you went to a, uh, a French website and it was in English and you called them up or sent them an email in English, you'd expect them to be able to respond in English um, because they have an English website. So this translation thing really can end up uh, leading to a lot of business process changes like the need to be able to do language in the business. Another, uh, if you put up a, a, a website in a foreign language, there's gonna be an expectation that you are open during their business hours. The way we like to put it to companies is, if you decide to fully translate your website and then post it, you need, it, you need to view that as opening a storefront right on the street in that country. You gotta speak the language, you have to be open when, they, when they're uh, expecting you to be open and so on. So it's one more little twist to thinking twice about fully translating the site. Um, I know a lot of the stuff I'm saying is why you shouldn't do it. If you have the resources to translate your site and you know there's a sp specific region or country that you're going after, it is a great thing to do. It will help you with search engine optimization. Obviously, it makes it easier for visitors to understand what your company is all about. It's a really good thing to do. It's just, we, sometimes I think, uh, especially small mid-sized companies, they go into translating the site uh, without their eyes open and don't realize the effort that, that's involved and some of the other changes beyond just simply changing the language on the site that can be involved. So that's why we wanna really drive this stuff home to you guys. Um, any questions about that? Okay. Now, fortunately, there's a really good alternative to this that's very, very effective. Um, we call it a translated introduction page. So the idea here is that you would, you take uh, a page one page from your website. It's usually the about us page that sort of explains your company and all that. A page that doesn't change all that often, right? Because anything that you translate is gonna need to be kept current. And if you translate your entire website, then you're gonna need, just like your, your US website, hopefully you're updating that on a reasonably regular basis. Well, any translated website that you have will also need to be updated on a, on a regular basis. Um, so the translated introduction page, the idea is you just have one page that you're gonna translate. And like I said, you pick something like about us that it's not gonna really change all that much. So you have that professionally translated, which is obviously much, much cheaper than having an entire website translated. It's, uh, it's much easier to deal with any kind of formatting issues that, excuse me, that result from that. Um, and then you put that site on your, on your website, uh, that translated page on your website. So you check a couple of boxes here with this. You, you get some translated content on your site, of course. You uh, obviously are very interested in doing business internationally. Why on earth would you have something like that on your site if you weren't, uh, particularly in countries that speak that, that language, right? So it's a really effective way to look really improve your, your uh, image as being open for international business, Dr potentially from a search engine perspective, draw in more visitors because you do have some translated content on your page uh, and just generally look much more competent uh, at doing business internationally, you, you know, like an like a international business seeking business outside of the US. And on this example here on the left, so that would be your translated introduction page and that red button in the middle might say something like, you know, click here to return to our main website or something, right? And then when they click there, they go back to your English website. 
So they're not under the impression that they can just call you up and speak the language uh, because you know you just have this one page that's translated. Uh, so this is really can be a very effective, very inexpensive way to, to get some really good translated content on your site, uh, you know, without breaking the bank. Any questions about that? All right. I guess one question about that: Where do you think they should put that? Like, uh, if you have a site that is translated, there will be bubbles at the top, like you were showing on the previous page. But if this is your home page or something, um, where would you put the different languages? Do you think there's buttons that go to it, or how do you suggest managing it from a navigation? Yes. So if you had, let's say you had this one in Chinese, you had a Spanish and a, a German. Um, when, when somebody hovers over the international inquiries, what we'll usually see companies do is a little drop down will appear and it'll say like Chinese, German, um, French, whatever, whatever translated introduction pages you have. And if they click on that, it'll actually take them to that page. And then some other, we've seen other companies put little flags along the top of their, you know, website. Make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. George, if it's George, uh, yeah. oh, sorry. No, you can go, go ahead. Go ahead, Leandria. Um, George, Todd Gherkin. Hi. Hey. Um, hey. Uh, going back a, a, a minute, um, uh, just to, to clarify something. Uh, great information about not translating your website um, if you're not really open for business in that language or perhaps even business hours. Um, but, but at the same time you said, but it's still a really good thing to translate your website. So if you go ahead and do that, but you're not open for during their business hours or you don't have a, you know, a Thai speaking person on your staff, do you somehow indicate that on your um, on your web page or yeah i mean the the business hours thing you could probably get away with easier than not having somebody on staff that speaks the language um because like i say if you if you went to an english website and you called them up and it was in thailand and nobody spoke english there that's that's burning a bridge pretty quickly right so the the, the business hours you could probably get away with and you just want to indicate that somewhere obvious on the inquiry uh, form and any you know someplace near wherever you have the phone number listed um, but yeah we I mean we've had clients that have had real issue with that because they do start getting phone calls in the language or emails in the language and they don't know how to obviously they don't speak the language so they don't know how to respond to it so okay yeah so George if you are if you're probably a newer company and you just want to sell everywhere, um, is there like a cap on the number of companies that you should include in that about us that are translated? I'm sorry, countries that are translated or do you just translate as many as you can? No, with translated introduction pages, you can just go crazy. Um, you can have as many as, as you decide you'd, you'd like to have on there because they're, they're part of the website structure, but they are their own you know, their own pages within the website. So it really doesn't matter. It doesn't hurt anything to have a whole bunch of them. And it's, it is a nice marketing. It's a very nice marketing move because like I said, if you use the about us, then the company will be able to go and really learn about your company, been in business for the past 30 years, you know, blah, 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 all the great stuff about your company and why they should reach out and, and do business with you. It, it really personalizes it um, very well. Uh, for somebody in another country if it's professionally translated into their language right thank you anything else Does somebody else have a question or a comment okay all right um I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but it is really important that your website have a, they call it an M version. It's really a mobile version. Now, the good news is that most of these tools now, WordPress and all, 
Joomla and all those tools out there. Uh, they typically automatically create an M version of your site uh, when, you, when you build your website. It's a good idea to go in and take a look at it and make sure it doesn't need any little tweaks here and there. But uh, in general, your website tool should have already built an M version of the site on the back end. And if somebody tries to come to your website on a mobile device, it'll, it'll detect that and it'll display the M version of the website. But that said, it is important that you go and check and make absolutely sure that your website has this M version and that it looks okay on a mobile device because the vast majority of uh, people in other countries and even here in the US now, they're accessing websites through mobile devices, uh, not, not desktops. Uh, so you, you really need, you need your website to look good and be uh, functional on a mobile device. Obviously, really easy to check. You just whip out your smartphone and go to your website and see what happens. But uh, if for some reason it doesn't look the way it should look, and this, by the way, this is something we, we look at when we do the website review as well, uh, it's, it's typically pretty easy for webmasters to straighten it out. But make sure you've got that. Okay, so before I talk about international promotion of your website, um, any questions at all about any of this up to this point? Is this useful information? I see a yes. lot of head nods, so that's a good sign. Okay, good. Yeah, I, by the way, I can't see you guys because when I turn <laughs> on the presentation, it takes up my whole screen. <laughs> all right, great. Okay, so let's talk about the international promotion of your company a bit. So this is uh, this is kind of kind of interesting. I when we first started pulling this whole program together, uh, not sure why in hindsight, but for some reason I was just thinking, okay, Google, maybe Yahoo, you get your site on those search engines and you're good to go. Well, you know, obviously that wasn't correct. There's there's many many search engines all over the world. Um, it's really important that uh, that your company be uh, registered with the most popular search engines in all of the countries that you're actually going after, right? Uh, now it is true that if you put up a website and do nothing else, in theory, someday over, you know, over, it may take a week, it may take a year, it may take 10 years, the web crawlers will eventually find your site and index it um, and, and include it in their search results in theory. But you really do need to make sure you identify which search engines are most popular in your target countries. And then I'm gonna talk in a second a little bit about how you can you know, proactively go in and register with them. So on this slide here, you, know, you can see, yeah, Google's used all over the world, um, but there are a whole bunch of other search engines depending on the country that are very popular as well. So in China, some of you may have heard of Baidu. You know, Baidu by far, by far, is the most popular search engine in China. And if you haven't actually gone in and registered with Baidu, uh, people in China probably aren't gonna find you, especially in China, because they have the firewall, the great firewall of China. Uh, they do not you know, go out there and index uh, websites that are just sort of out there on the global internet. They've got a lot of controls over that. So if you're looking for business in China, very, very important that you're registered on Baidu, as well as you know a couple of the others that are popular there. And then in South Korea, I had never even heard of this uh, search engine called Naver, but 75% of people in South Korea, when they go to search for something on the internet, they go to Naver. So if you haven't gone and registered with Naver, then you're probably not gonna, they're not gonna find you in South Korea. And, and you know, this is the case in a lot of different countries around the world. Uh, these are, these two are, uh, particularly important because the proportion of people using these two search engines is just really, really enormous. But in other countries, you know, you have things like in, in Russia, there's Yandex, uh, which I also hadn't heard of, and 50% of people that in Russia are using Yandex, etc. So each country has certain search engines that are really popular. And it's really important to make sure you go proactively register on those search engines. So in order to figure out which search engines are the most popular in your target countries, there are a number of different, if you go on the internet and you just Google most popular search engine, uh, you'll find a lot of different charts like this one. This one's from Jimmy Data. Um, 
but, but you'll find a lot of this information. It's not hard to find. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna go in, you're gonna figure out which countries you're targeting, or if you're just trying to sort of go global, uh, pull up this kind of information and notice which search engines are most popular in all the different countries. And then what you're gonna do is go to those particular search engine sites and all of them are gonna have something similar to what you see on the screen now. It's, a, it's where you actually register your, your website uh, with the search engine. So I don't know how, how easy it is to read, but there's a, there's a space there for your URL, you know, your website. Uh, you don't actually have to put any comments in there. And then it wants to make sure you're not a robot. So you have to put in the, um, uh, that little code or most of them will have something like that to ensure you're not a robot. And then you just click add Earl. Now what that's gonna do is it's gonna trigger whatever web crawler or, 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 or spider that they're, the search engine uses to go index your website. So it's gonna go and it's gonna scan your website and it's gonna include it in search results based on what it finds, based on the content on your website. Now that little, uh, that statement at the bottom of this slide uh, starts to get into the technical weeds a little bit, but it's really important. Um, there's two different types of sitemaps. One is called an HTML sitemap. And that's, uh, I, I think we've all probably seen those. It's, it looks like the index of a book. You actually, it's me meant to be read. Sometimes at the very bottom of a website, you'll see something that's a link that says sitemap and you click it and you get this index, basically is what it looks like. Well, for these web crawlers, what you wanna do is make sure you, um, you wanna actually register your XML sitemap. Now the XML sitemap is a separate sitemap that's, um, not designed to be read. It's not designed to be looked at by, by, by a person. It, it looks like computer code. And uh, it's optimized for the search engines to go through and to actually scan it and then index your website within search engines. So the syntax uh, almost, almost always is what you see below, uh, that company.com forward slash sitemap.xml. So what you do is it's you know very simple. You just go ahead and look up your sitemap.xml and you um, copy and paste that to uh, into that URL field and, uh, and add your URL. And that's gonna trigger the web crawler, the search engine to go scan your site. Any questions about that? Just quickly ask, um, this particular part you said is gonna, you're going to be producing a PowerPoint afterwards. Is this included? Yeah, you guys will get this this presentation that I'm showing you now. Oh, that's great! I, I just found this part very interesting and uh, just wanted to double check. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And of course, I, my contact information is included too. So. Once we go through this, if you have questions, what did George say about that? You can always reach out to me anytime. Thank you very much, it's great. Yeah, yeah, sure. So sometimes our companies, you know, they'll say, okay, well, we're, we're going global, we're not picky. If anybody likes our products in any particular country, um, we, we, uh, we wanna go ahead and register with the search engines that are popular with them. Uh, how, how do you go about doing this? How much time does it take and all that? Well, you know, you'd have, you have to go look up which, which search engines are in each country, you know, that chart, like the Jimmy data or something. And uh, sometimes we'll just uh, suggest to companies that they, they hire an intern or if they've got a, uh, you know, a high school kid or something looking for something to do, pay them a few bucks and they just go through and within, you know, I don't know, it depends on how many hours in a day that they put into it. But within a few days, say five or six days of part-time work, you could go ahead and register your, your, your company on just about every search engine, you know, that's out there that, that, that's widely used. It wouldn't take that much time. The other quick comment to make is on this screen, you know, I mentioned I, on the left is Google main, which is just that google.com. And on the right is, uh, you probably can't read it, but it's google.es. So it's Google Spain. Those, you do want to go into each one of the different Google uh, search engine registration mechanisms. As, as you see on the screen, and register your site in each one. Uh, the main reason is that there's different server farms around the world. So the main Google site that, uh, that, that's over here, with, you know, we're tapping into for the US and probably Canada and whatnot, 
uh, it, it's different servers. So if you just register on that main.com website, that will not trigger the web crawlers in other countries to go scan your site. Now in Europe, I'm sure Google doesn't have a like a server farm in every country, but but if it's best practice would be to go to Google Spain and go ahead and enter your URL that, there. Then go to google.fr for France and enter your URL there and, and, and. Just go to each country and make sure you enter it in just to make absolutely sure that you've triggered the uh, web crawler to come index your site for that particular country. Make sense? Okay. So um, a quick question. Yeah. Is it is it ideal to purchase a domain name in whatever language? So for example, if you were trying to target France and you wanted to get a French domain name, would you want to purchase a domain similar to whatever your English domain is, or would you just keep your English domain and register that everywhere? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's the next slide. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> Continue. Yeah, so are you a plant? <laughs> um, so, yeah, what you're talking about, those are called country code top level domains. And it's a great idea to go buy those uh, for a couple of reasons. One reason is that when you own a country code top level domain, like in this, you know, at that on that bullet point, yourcompany.fr for France. Um, the way the internet looks at that when it's scanning your website and indexing your company and whatnot, it views it as kind of like you're virtually local. So the search engines have all gotten very, uh, well, I guess localized is a good way of putting it. Basically, the search engine is trying to, to present the best results for a client are related to whatever it is they search for. And of course, some local company is viewed by those algorithms as being a better result than a company in the United States, right, or in some other country. So a country code top level domain gets you a lot of uh, search engine optimization bump because if somebody in France goes and searches for products that your company makes and you have that .fr uh, top level domain, it's going to give you uh, favoritism over just a plain old .com website because it views you as being local. To the, to the person who's doing the search. So it makes a big difference for you from a search engine optimization perspective. Now, as specific to your question, typically you would want to keep the same uh, URL format, meaning, you know, if, if you're like acmeco.com, you'd want to be acmeco.fr and acmeco.es and acmeco.jp, et cetera. You wouldn't want to change that URL. You want to keep it the same but just get the, uh, the, the different uh, uh, country domain, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does, that answers my okay. question. Yeah, okay. It's particularly valuable if you're, uh, it, it's, it's not a bad thing to just go around and, and buy a whole bunch of these globally, but, but it's particularly valuable if you are targeting a specific country. In fact, we always re highly recommend that if you're going after customers in Spain, go ahead and buy this country code top level domain for Spain, right? Because you, you get the search engine optimization benefit. Uh, you also protect your brand. And uh, that's been a big problem in some countries like China where there's, there's companies out there that just go around buying up the Chinese country code top level domain for, for companies, not just US, but companies worldwide. And then they hold it hostage. And then you have to buy it back from them. And there's even problems where they'll actually open up a company uh, basically stealing your company name and uh, and that using that country code top level domain and uh, you know can cause your company a lot of grief and it can get really expensive to uh, to try to buy those back so good idea to buy them to protect your brand uh, that what I just described when around uh, companies stealing your country code top level domain it's it's not widespread uh, most countries have laws against that but China it happens in China. Um, it happens in India. Um, you know, we've we've had some issues with it in Brazil. There's a few countries out there that uh, 
where that is a problem. So we typically say that, you know, if you have the means, it's not a bad idea to go ahead and buy them in those countries just to avoid and protect your, protect your brand. Any other questions around this? So going back to your previous slide, um, when you go to submit to these domains, would you want to submit both your English version and your French version to whatever Google or Google they use, search engine they use, or would you just submit the the French URL? Yeah, that's a great question. So in terms of registering with the search engines, um, you could probably do either. Now I don't you know, I, I, I try to talk to my friends that are still in the IT world about this stuff as often as I can, because these algorithms are always changing, right? And they're changing what, what benefits a company in the, in the rankings and all of that all the time. Um, let's say that you did put your country code top level domain in there. That, that page, that translated introduction page, let's say, is going to be uh, part of your web's architecture. And the XML site map is, is comprehensive. It includes every single page, in your entire website. So the search engine would still scan your entire website. It, the entry point would just be that country code top level domain page that you registered. So if you didn't put that in and you put in your .com website, it will still go scan your whole website and see your country code top level domain page and, and see that localization, right? So I don't know of any benefit using one over the other. Um, there's no disadvantage to putting in the country code top level domain. And I could imagine one of these, the algorithm liking that for some reason. So I'd probably say put that in there because it can't hurt. Gotcha. All right. All right. And in terms of getting these things, um, there's a lot of different websites out there like this one. Uh, it, it's like you guys may be familiar with GoDaddy where you go to buy. URLs. Um, you just go to one of these sites and uh, you, you type in what you're interested in and the country that you're interested in. In this case, it's uh, pauseandrewind.com.fr uh, that they're looking for down there. And if it's available, um, you just simply buy it. And each country, you see on the screen here, this is for two years. Uh, the registration fee is two fifty nine for two years. So the, these things aren't that expensive. So you can go around and buy, you know, a few of them without without completely blowing the budget. There are certain countries. I use France on purpose. Some countries do have some requirements and regulations around this. So you do want to go take a quick look at that uh, to make sure that um, you're allowed to, to to buy this thing. So for example, in France, uh, you do have to have a local presence. Now, a local presence can be a partner or somebody like that. It, it, you don't have to actually have a, a office, but you do have to have a local presence. And our organization, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we, we help our clients find partners in country. So in France, for example, they would use the partner as their local presence for these. But really easy to get hold of. Um, I like this website just because everything is just front and center. It's really easy to understand. And you can go through and buy a few of these things pretty easily at one time. Any questions about that? So if and when you decide to start going to do this and you find out that it's not available, which means somebody else bought it, uh, one of the things you guys can do is come to us and we can reach out to our people in at Post and they can help research what's going on. Uh, and, and sometimes you know, getting the embassy after people, sometimes it can make them sort of play nice and, and give it back. Uh, and like I said, in a lot of countries, they're not allowed to have it in the first place. So it's usually pretty easy to resolve that. Hopefully you don't run into it, but if you do, just reach out to us and we can help you straighten that out. All righty. So another, uh, really important thing, uh, arguably, I think one of the most important things that these algorithms are looking at associated with your, your web presence are these things called link backs. It's really simple. A link back is just a link to your website from some other website. And uh, 
you can, you know, there's all sorts of different types of link backs out there. I mean, obviously, if you've got an Amazon store, there's probably a link to your website from that Amazon store. That would be a link back. But the algorithms have gotten really smart. So they, they're, some link backs are, are viewed as much more valuable in, than others. So a link back from your Amazon store, it's not going to give you a whole lot of search engine optimization bump because of that, because I mean, you set up the Amazon store, you're linking back to yourself in a lot of ways, et cetera. Uh, however, if you have a, a, a company that you do business with that perhaps you know supplies you different types of parts or whatever from the products you make, uh, you guys can, it's a really valuable link back to have links from those types of companies to your website. So what we encourage a lot of our clients to do is figure out which kind of complementary companies are out there and contact them and see if you guys, if they're willing to link to your site, if you link to their site and that kind of thing. Um, another really valuable link back is any kind of article or white paper that you manage to get uh, published somewhere. And those usually include some a link to your site or your company. Uh, that's viewed as a really valuable link back. So point is that the more link backs, excuse me, the more link backs you can get, the better, uh, especially those high quality link backs. Um, we offer a service called a FUSE listing, which stands for Featured U.S. Exporters, which the, the most valuable part of it is this .gov link back. So, you know, I just mentioned that the Amazon link back may not be as valuable to the algorithm as a link back from one of your uh, partner companies. But .gov link backs, because you normally can't buy them, and they're link backs from government websites, which you, you and I can't just go set one up. You have to be a government entity to set it up. The algorithms view those as by far, uh, by, by a mile, the most valuable type of link back. Because if a government site is linking to your company for some reason, that's a, that's a pretty strong indication that whatever that search term was, your company must be an authority on that particular search term because why on earth would a government site be linking to your company uh, if you weren't? And so very, very valuable. It can make a big difference. Uh, we've had some companies <laughs> just all they did was go out and buy a bunch of fuse listings and they saw their search engine optimization just skyrocket. You know, they went from page five to page one just from doing this because the .gov link back is, is so, so, uh, such a strong, um, advantage within those algorithms when they're trying to figure out how to index and how to rank your your site so these are you just go to that website at the bottom of the slide there and you can buy these things uh they're they're pretty inexpensive uh, i think 250 dollars you get five of them the actual listing so what it actually is it's a it's a listing that describes your company uh that's that they post on the consulate and embassy websites in whatever country you bought the link back for, or the fuse listing for. So uh, the, the actual listing is not all that impressive. It's kind of buried on the website. It's not all that easy to find. So we uh, most of our clients don't get a whole lot of traffic from the listing itself, but the real value of it is that link back that you get, because uh, that'll help you in the US and internationally. This isn't just an international thing. A .gov link back in general is gonna help your search engine optimization enormously. So any questions about that? Does that make sense to you guys? You following? Uh, George, uh, Todd Girk again. Um, yeah. I, if you would, give us a little bit more specific um, understanding of how that link back works. For example, if I go to a UPS website, um, uh, how is it? Do I have to click on something in order for that link back to work, or does it? Is it just I click on some subject matter or something on the UPS website and it brings up my website? Or yeah, that the link back is just a. If you click somewhere, it will link to your company's website. So, um, and you guys have seen this. You, you're reading an article in a magazine about some company, and there's some. Click, clickable thing and if you click it you end up on their website that's a link back so it is just a uh, and, and what happens is these algorithms the, the web crawlers when they go index these websites like the embassy website they're going to see these link backs to your company and 
they, you know, th that becomes a factor in your company's ranking when people search for trucks, if your company sells trucks, right? And the government site is linking to your, back to your site uh, related to truck search. So the algorithms have this built in so that they use all that as a factor to determine where to rank your company in the listings when somebody searches for trucks. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Any other questions about these? It's a really good thing to do. Um, if you didn't do anything else, uh, I'd say you'd want to go do these because they're just super easy. So, um, by, by the way, one other thing I wanted to mention about link bags. So .gov are by far the best. Uh, next in line are .edu. So, and it's the same kind of logic. You, you and I can't go buy a .edu education um, URL. Only registered, licensed educational institutions can have .edu as a URL. So the theory that the algorithms use, if Google and Yahoo and all those guys, is that uh, if a .edu website is linking back to your company, then you must be author an authority on whatever the search term topic, the related search term topic topic was. So the same theory, not given quite as much weight as a .gov link back, but those those are sort of like second, and then all the rest are sort of even, .com, .net, you know, .org, all that other stuff. So I mentioned that because if you do, you know, if you, if you produce any kind of white paper article or anything like that, make sure you submit it to all sorts of universities and whatnot. You, you never know. One of them might pick it up and decide to post it on their site, and that can really help you out. I just quickly ask you, yeah. does, does um, you know, based on the URLs, does an email address carry the same kind of weight on um, for link backing as what a basic URL would? So if um, my email address is, you know, Gary Art, so and so, because the URL is part of that and it's listed on the website, does that carry the same kind kind of weight? Yeah, it's interesting. I asked my, my buddies that exact question and they said it does not. That the algorithms look for an at symbol um, and if it sees it, 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 it interprets that as being a web, a web uh, an email address and it does not give it um, weight. Right. Yeah. So it has okay. to be the full URL for the company. I appreciate that. I was just trying to think ahead. To yeah. Try and try to do something with this information. Uh, I, I like what I like what where this is leading, um, you know. You've got to create your own traffic sometimes, you know. Um, yeah. I, I was, just wanted to get that clear in my mind for taking the conversation forward internally, you know. So mm -hmm. uh, save us some time not to focus too much on email addresses, for example. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Sure thing. One other quick comment related to, related to linkbacks. This isn't as common as it used to be, but there are companies out there that will uh, tell you that if you pay them a bunch of money, they're going to link back to your website a thousand times from a thousand different URLs and all of that. The algorithms have gotten really smart, so if you you don't want to try to trick them that way. Um, you know th those types of sort of shenanigans that used to work in the past uh, don't work, and they can actually end up getting you knocked way, way down by the search engines because they, they sort of know what's going on. They know which companies are doing that kind of thing. So, you know, illegitimate link backs is probably a good way of, of putting that. If somebody contacts, there's there's some sort of link back opportunity that you hear of that doesn't seem like it's playing fair, the algorithm is going to know that and it's going to hurt you. So don't, you know, don't fall for it. Okay, so. A number of these things I just mentioned can combine together into a really powerful um, kind of blended strategy for you that is going to cost you very, very little money, but have a, make a huge difference. So, you know, I mentioned these fuse. We were just talking about the fuse listings with the .gov link back. Well, here's the deal. For $50, they'll translate what you send to them uh, professionally. You know, they've got these people at the embassy that will translate these things for you for 50 bucks. So what we usually tell our clients to do is, well, for the fuse listing, send them the about us page of your of your company, 
and have them translate that about us um, content. Then take the translation and use that as your translated introduction page, which we talked about before. So now you've got the translated content professionally translated for 50 bucks. You, it's easy enough to create the translated introduction page, just adding a page to your website. Then go purchase the country code top level domain for the target countries. And then use that uh, translated introduction page as the URL target of that country code top level domain, if that makes sense. So, you know, you buy the .fr, you have a translated introduction page in French, that .fr URL is where would lead somebody to that translated introduction page, which is in French. So you have this really nice sort of blended strategy of all these things I've been mentioning that will just make an enormous difference for you guys, um, both on the search engine optimization perspective, but also in the marketing side, just because you'll be doing all these things, it'll make you much more appealing to purchasers in those target countries, not to mention other countries as well. So does that make sense? You guys follow me on that? I'm seeing head nods, that, that, that's a yes. Yeah, so this is a, you know, I don't know how many of you on the, on the call are actually sort of webmasters and good at this stuff. Sometimes I get questions like, you know, that, I'm, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I blurt this out, and it, it's really any webmaster can sort of make all this happen very, very easily. This isn't complicated at all. Um, but when you combine all those things together, it will make a big difference for you guys. And I think uh, when you get this, this this presentation, if if you do take it to your um, you know internal web people and all that, and explain to them what what you'd like to do, they're going to understand really quickly what you're up to here and be able to implement this fast for you. And so with $250, you'd get five countries. Uh, let's just say you decided to translate all of them. You know, now you're at 500 bucks, more or less. You buy some country code top double domains for 250 a piece. It lasts a couple of years. So, you know, $1,000 basically, and you've got a really, really powerful improvement to your, um, your website from a globalization perspective. Okay. So the other thing we, we always like to talk to clients about is just making sure they're getting the insight uh, out of their website. Um, I think hopefully most of you have some sort of a tool attached to your, to your website right now, like, like Google Analytics or something that lets you go in and see where a lot of the web traffic is coming from. If you don't, it's a very good idea to do that. Um, if you have a webmaster and just ask them, I'm, I, I'd be surprised if you didn't have something like this already. But the bottom line is, when companies come to us and they, they're, they're wondering where they should go, which country should we pursue, one really good piece of marketing intelligence uh, related to that is your website. You can go in there and figure out where, where's your traffic coming from, from overseas. Now, sometimes it doesn't really tell you much, but sometimes it does. If it turns out that you know, 20% of the visitors to your website are from India. It's pretty good. It's pretty good indication that people in India are looking for whatever it is your company does. Um, and so that could be great marketing intelligence that you could bring to us, and then we could reach out to our people in India and confirm that in fact it's a good market and all that other good stuff. But you can really use this as great marketing intelligence to figure out which countries are are sending people most often to your to your website. Uh, and on this slide, there's you know there's a there's a few different um, things you can check out. Google.com trends uh, show you some interesting information. The uh, Google Global Market Finder there, that thing is really cool. It's a free tool online that lets you go in and you put in the keywords associated with your company and it'll tell you um, based on a number of different data points which countries are likely good target markets for you. And one of the most important data points that it uses is it will tell you in which countries are people searching most for those search terms, which probably a good indication of countries that need your stuff. So that's a really cool tool. Go check that out when you have the chance. Um, and then Google keywords, you know, that you can buy, well, there, there's a lot of stuff associated with Google keywords, probably outside of the scope of this conversation, but you can, um, you can go pay for uh, search terms and, and, and all that through 
through Google in particular, and a lot of those other search engines that I mentioned in other countries have the same kinds of services. Um, we typically we typically don't advise our clients to do that until they find some sort of partner in that target country. And then that partner in the target country would be better equipped to decide whether that was going to be a helpful marketing strategy in that country, right? Because it kind of varies. Um, but it is another uh, another interesting sort of option out there to improve your web presence globally. So before I get into talking a little bit about internationalization, any well, any questions about anything so far? Anything you guys want more clarification on? Okay. Okay, so internationalization, uh, I mentioned this at the beginning, it's really just the process of taking your website and making sure that it's just culturally neutral. So if a guy in you know Saudi Arabia comes to your site or somebody from Brazil or somebody from France, it, it, your site is fine. It's not going to have anything on it that, that may be deemed offensive in all this. Now, the truth is as, as the world becomes more and more globalized, uh, the risk of this has diminished. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, you could really go wrong if you used the wrong color even on your website because colors had all have meaning um, in, in different countries and, and all this. But it, it's diminished just because the world has become more global. But I do have a specific example just to sort of drive home what we're talking about here. Uh, we had a client who made furniture and on their homepage, they had a really nice desk, an executive desk. And they had, uh, you know, a, a business guy sitting there with his feet up on his desk. And the thing is, the soles of his shoes were pointed out. And when we sent the site to the Middle East, and we're just asking for just quick, hey, you notice anything about this site that might offend somebody in your country? They immediately came back and said, you can't know that showing the soles of, soles of the shoes is an enormous insult. You can't do that. You got to change that. That will just culturally not fly here. So that's an example of what internationalization is all about. It's just making sure that there's nothing on the site that's uh, going to really turn somebody off and, and cause them to uh, to not want to reach out and do business with your company. This uh, Zing site is a really good example of this. So you can see that uh, it's it's very consistent. Obviously, it's exactly the same company. It's basically the same website. But it's neutral, right? They, they use shade of green, so it's not usually primary colors if they're going to get you in trouble at all. Primary colors are the colors that do that. Um, they have silhouettes of people, so there's no particular uh, particular person from a particular country or anything like that. It's just silhouettes. And the top, the top uh, on the top left, that's their main website. Um, the one in the middle is in Spanish, and then the one in the bottom is in Japanese. Um, you know, the, the structure is exactly the same. It's the same site. They translated it because in, I guess they were targeting people in those particular countries, but they didn't change the site. They didn't localize the site to be culturally specific to any particular region or country. So this is a really good example of what internationalization looks like. And the reason companies do this is, well, one, just to be consistent globally. Um, they also typically will design the site. An internationalized site is designed in a way that makes translation uh, simpler. So when I was mentioning German, you know, German is huge words and Chinese is small, small symbols. Uh, these, these internationalized sites are designed in a way to accommodate for that without blowing up the structure of the site. So, you know, sometimes companies, depending on what their site is, is like now, they'll take some steps to sort of further internationalize and neutralize their site. For a global audience. So does that make sense to you guys, the internationalization thing? And this isn't something that all of our clients do or even necessarily need to do, but it's sort of the next step after making those simple enhancements that we've been talking about up to this point. Okay. Now, briefly talk about localization. Uh, and regionalization and localization are similar. Regionalization, the difference is just it's a regional target. So rather than being uh, specific to a particular country, 
it's, it's going to be more of region like Middle East versus Saudi Arabia specifically, right? But localization really drills down to the actual specific country. Now, this gets really complicated. And we do have clients come to us sometimes and say, well, we want to develop a website for Mexico. And this is kind of like the translation thing. If you had the resources to maintain the site on a regular basis and to translate it and to do everything the way you need to do it, this is a really good idea, but it is literally setting up a whole different, a whole new website that's culturally different and all of that. So it takes quite a bit of uh, effort to both set one of these up and to maintain it. So it's one of those things where great thing to do if you're really, really certain that you want to do it, but you need to know what you're getting into. So when, when if you hire a professional to do this, it's not just simply them changing your website and slapping a Mexican flag on it, for example. It's going to be, um, they're going to look at the, the different cultural dimensions like high context versus low context. Well, it's all the marketing stuff. I don't know, uh, you guys may have seen some of these you know, Japanese websites that have like Technicolor octopuses flying across the screen and you basically have a seizure when you're looking at the website. Well, that works in Japan, but if you set, if you just took that and put it in the US and translated it into English, that would not work in America, right? That is not um, a culturally neutral website. <laughs> it sells great there, but not here. Same idea here. Um, you really are building a whole new website that's culturally specifically targeted at uh, the country you're going after. So you wouldn't just translate it into Spanish, you translate it into Mexican Spanish, um, all the syntax and stuff that, that that entails. And typically companies will do this after they've internationalized their site because they wanna have a sort of a, a set structure for their site before they start culturally adapting it. And here's some examples of that. So Cisco, you know, Again, you can tell it's internationalized. It sort of looks a little bit like that Zing site, but the one on the top left is their main website, .com. The one in the middle, and I know these are overlaps, so you can't see them too well, but the one in the middle is actually their Brazilian site. So it's not just translated into Portuguese. Uh, they use Im imagery and, and all that, and they probably spend way too much money to come to the conclusion that that brown color meant something to Brazilians, who knows? But they, they it's actually, culturally specific to Brazil. And then the one in the bottom right, Japanese, again, same kind of thing. Uh, you, you're obviously on the same company's website, but it's not just translated. I mean, these are clearly Japanese people. And I'm sure the purple behind that business guy and the green behind the professor looking guy and the orange behind the young lady, some marketing guys have determined that that triggers me to want to buy servers or something. I mean, you know, there a lot goes into this whole localization of websites and a lot of marketing dollars are spent and all that. So that's the big difference. Are you guys following me? Yes, we are. Lots of head nods. All right. So at the end of the day, what we recommend uh, related to all this is you make the simple enhancements, right? They're easy, they're inexpensive. Uh, if you have you know, a little extra money, uh, go for that that three-step blended strategy that I mentioned, but you know that wouldn't that shouldn't be more than even a thousand bucks. You could probably do it for less than that, and then go from there, and then work with us to find a partner in these countries to help sell your products. Right then, once you have that partner identified, well, you can work with a partner in country to figure out your in-country digital strategy. So if you if, if once you have that partner in Mexico, and you collaboratively decide, you know what, it'll be great to have, a, for our company to have a Mexican website. Well, then you've got, a, excuse me, a partner down there that can help you with that and make it a lot less expensive to develop and all of that because they're in country, right? Um, and they're gonna, in theory, they're gonna have a much better understanding of, uh, of, of what's gonna work down there, how to tap into the local online marketplaces, all the stuff associated with having a localized website and a local presence on the web. Uh, but we, we usually discourage our clients from trying to do it just from the U.S. before you actually have an in-country partner. And for one thing, you're, we're going to want a partner down there because, in theory, you're going to start selling lots of stuff. And not having some sort of local entity to assist in the facilitation of all those sales and whatnot, everything that entails, uh, is really risky. So work with us, get the partner, and then figure out with the partner your in-country digital strategy. Make sense? 
Okay. So now let's just talk a little bit about international e-commerce. Fundamentally, there's, uh, from an e-commerce perspective, there's basically three different types of, well, three different types of websites out there. Uh, information delivery sites, that's pretty much, that's most websites. I mean, every website to some degree is an information delivery site. Uh, most websites stop there. They don't have some sort of online shopping cart capability and all that, but then, you know, some do. With the last bullet point, the transactional sites, something like Target, right, where you can just go online and just buy stuff, put in your credit card, it shows up at your doorstep. And then there's these e-marketplaces uh, that are uh, often industry specific, but they're market makers. So it, it, they're not, it's not so much a shopping cart type capability. It's more bringing you know, buyers and sellers of particular products in particular industry sectors together and so that they can interact through that particular platform and then in theory buy, buy and sell things. So what we've been talking about is all about the information delivery side of things, um, especially when you're talking about international. It, it can be very, very risky to try to sell, sell things cross-border via e-commerce. And when, when I'm defining e-commerce as an online sale without interacting with a human being. So the target model, right, where you just buy something and it shows up on your doorstep. There's just so many intricacies around doing business cross-border that uh, doing it just through a computer without human intervention it's just risky you've got to make sure you're compliant with all the laws in those countries uh, there's many different things that that you have to accommodate related to an, an international sale that you don't have to worry about when it's just somebody in another you know city or state here in the united states so we we typically you know there's exception to every rule we typically say companies don't do this don't try to do cross-border e-commerce this goes back to what I'd said before around find a partner in that country, because you're gonna need a partner in that country anyways, more than likely, in order to really be able to transact in a big way, uh, a meaningful way in that country. So once you find the partner, figure out your in-country e-commerce strategy with the partner, but don't try to try to conduct e-commerce sort of cross-border from the United States. We get it, there's a lot of, uh, of kind of horror stories that companies run into because they weren't compliant with one thing or another. They didn't abide by certain labeling laws that you know, didn't have a business license. There's just many things that can go wrong uh, if you're not fully on top of how to do business in whatever target country you're going after. And in the process of finding a partner, you know, we help you figure that out. Obviously the partner that you ultimately get helps you figure that out. And then the e-commerce strategy uh, can be pulled together in coordination with those that, that partner. Does that make sense to you guys? Again, I'm talking about if, if you happen to have any kind of shopping cart capability, I'm just talking about you enabling it so somebody in Saudi Arabia can just simply buy something on your on your website. You're committed to getting it to them. Um, sometimes our companies will set up a separate shopping cart for international, so it, it functions like a shopping cart, and the person can build up their purchase, but then they can't just submit it and buy it. When they submit it or send it, <laughs> uh, it goes to a person who's responsible for international sales and that person reviews it and then contacts them and sorts everything out to make sure that it's a legit transaction. It's not just sort of a, well, like the Target example where they put in their credit card number and they're just expecting it on their doorstep in a few days. Uh, that's where you can really, really run into big problems. Okay, well, um, one of the last things I wanted to just mention to you is that there's there's a growing number of these e-marketplaces. Uh, we're all familiar with Amazon, and Amazon has um, Amazon France, they have Amazon UK, there's an Amazon in lots of different countries. Um, definitely leverage these, especially again, once you find that partner, and, and those partners are gonna know uh, which one of these marketplaces within their particular uh, business environments is most effective and whatnot. But uh, they can be great ways to, to move product and to get your name out there. Um, they're improving all the time, right? The technology is getting better and better. Uh, it's interesting, I was just reading an article the other day about cryptocurrency is enabling a lot of people in other countries that were not able to buy things from the United States to suddenly be able to. And marketplaces are popping up to enable those people 
to actually purchase things because because of their new new access to cryptocurrencies and stuff. So it's really an expanding uh, domain, these marketplaces, and something you certainly want to take advantage of. But again, not you know not probably not just from the U.S. You'd want to have somebody in in whatever country you're going after uh, to sort of facilitate the process. And with that, see, 